We live in this world that is systematically unequal. So we have designed it to favor one group over another and over another. And we start to say terms like unconscious bias and microaggression and macroaggression. But I would argue that we should really be saying racism. No, you can't touch my hair. Equitable Action for Change stands in prayer to all our indigenous ancestors around the world, enslaved, stolen, displaced, lost, and free. From Punt, Masar, Timbuktu, Uluru, Alteria, Turtle Island, and all indigenous lands on Mother Earth, known and unknown, spoken and unspoken. None of us would be here without our indigenous ancestors. Ashe, amen. We recognize and acknowledge that the land in which we live and work has been a site of human activity for 15,000 years. This land is the territory of the Huron-Wendat and Petun First Nations, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. The territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Confederacy of the Ojibwe and Allied Nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. We speak all your names in gratitude and reverence. Today, the meeting place of Takaranto, Toronto is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island and around the world. And we're grateful to have the opportunity to work and live in the community on this territory. Ashe, amen. Hello everyone, my name is Marvel Monroe and I am one of the founders of Ballroom here in Canada. Equitable Action for Change is a black created, led and focused multi-service agency located right here in Toronto. They work with black identifying two SLGBTQ plus communities with multiple identities, with multifaceted needs. Today I'm interviewing four members of the ballroom community for insight on how they're growing in their ballroom family. Hi, my name is Alexia, but everybody knows me as Lexi, AKA Butter, Pink Lady, and you know it, I'm a whole vibe. <laughs> Period. <laughs> Do you feel that as a Black identifying person, you have to deal with more hurdles and obstacles in life than a non-Black person? Uh, absolutely, because just walking around looking different, as well as being a woman on top of it, I definitely deal with a lot more than even Black men deal with, because every day there's harassment. <laughs> every single day. <laughs> How have you managed to overcome stigma and build a strong sense of self despite societal hurdles? I'd say uh, family, chosen family. Um... Chosen family being your ballroom family? Exactly, yes, absolutely. And just like friends, because I don't have um, 
my mother's passed away and I don't really have family at all. So everybody in my circle becomes my chosen family. So definitely those are the people who I lean on that, that get me through a lot of things. Yeah. How have you survived stigma and dealing with the issues of self-esteem? Well, since I was a little girl from puberty, I, yeah, I've been groped and, 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 and approached by older men because as a young black girl, you develop and you're an object to everybody that that's around at, at that time. So to get over those things, I, I definitely worked on self-esteem, just learning to love myself. Uh, and through that journey, I found a community that embraced me and my body and everything like that. So it just made it a lot easier. Hi, my name is Butta and that's short for butterfly. And I came out of my cocoon and shined and just embraced everything about my body. Before I loved myself, now I love myself. So yes, <laughs> now I walk sex siren and I never thought that I could do that stuff outside in front of all of these people and live. So absolutely, yeah. Do you feel that there is a focus on a certain type of look? body type or image that is perpetuated what harm do you feel this causes well the typical look that has been around in society i would say is you know skinny white women uh with big boobs and like no butts uh, but then there's a wave that comes where it's like ooh thick is in, shape is in, uh, uh, ass is in, and then all these white girls now are then getting it done and paying for what was gifted to a lot of us. Um, so it perpetuates uh, plastic surgery, eating disorders, because now then there's young black girls who feel like they need to look like these white women, i.e. Kim Kardashian, things like this, and be skinny like her and still have their big butts but it just that's not that, that's not the way your body is sis you need to love who you are so yeah yes because then there's uh, um, because there's BBWs and people will tell them like oh you're not thick you're you're like a BBW but if she feels like she wants to call herself thick then she is thick but thick is a thick is a mindset to me thick is not thick is not necessarily a sizing it's how you feel. If, if I feel thick today, if I feel fluffy, then that's what it is. Do you know what I mean? Do you feel that there is more focus on physical appearance within the Bollywood community more than other two SLGBTQ plus communities? Why do you think so? I think because we are a judging community itself. We absolutely, the whole thing of Ballroom is judging. There's a panel of judges judging you so non-stop like I, I, I was told don't don't ballroom if you do not have thick skin <laughs> this is what I was told flat out don't do it if you can't handle criticism judgment people telling you no people chopping you period so if you really can't handle it it's not the scene for you because you will be judged from your clothes to your breath you will be judged what about the people who are trying to develop thick skin I say definitely, if you are trying to develop it, choose a house wisely because the house matters. Definitely the house matters on how thick your skin will get or on how you will be crying in the bathroom. So, yeah. Hi, my name is Shamaki Ishmael, um, also known as Cash007 also known as Cash Exprada, also known as Cash Unbothered, also known as Cash, a whole bunch of other things, Cash Monroe, but um, yes, I've been in ballroom for 13, 14 years now, oh my fucking God, I've been in ballroom for 13 years, um, I first started in the house of Monroe, and that's where I kind of got my start from, and now I am kind of sitting in the cut at the 007, I walk performance, I walk hand performance, I pretty much walk, walk anything if there's money involved, but um, what's it called, yeah, that's it. We often hear Black identifying 2S LGBTQ plus folks saying they feel ostracized and rejected by family, friends, and community once they come out. Have you experienced this or heard about other experiences? 
Um, I think that's a pretty normal experience that a lot of black queer people face. Thankfully, in 2021, um, things are seeming to make a change and a difference. Um, I'm 29 years old now, but coming out, I came out around coming out around 5, 15, 16 years old. And at that time, I really thought, I didn't even know as a young child that black people were gay or were allowed to be gay or was a possibility. I really just thought it was a white thing. Um, so coming out and not being able to have people to relate to and being able to come and find ballroom, it was a really big change for me to see like a sea full of black people that I could relate to and that we share some experiences. Um, I come from an African Muslim background, so the idea of being able to be your fully formed individual self within that community is something that a lot of people face. Coming from a black and sorry, coming from an African and Muslim family, um, the feeling of being ostracized is something that a lot of people face. It's hard to see yourself in a community where you know you're not loved. So finding ballroom to be able to create that second sort of family to create that different type of uh dynamic system that you never had before it's a really big experience how have you been displaced or felt ostracized um i come from a uh, somali background so within that um the idea of homosexuality let alone being able to be in ballroom is something that is extremely unheard of so the, co the concept of being yourself or even having to separate both lives is a big thing that a lot of people face and that I face for the first time. Um, I felt displaced in the sense of coming to ballroom, I had to kind of create my own sense of family, create my own sense of dynamic that I never necessarily received back home from my family. So with that, um, in 2010, I believe, I started a house called House of Expanaganza. And within that, I was able to kind of create a family structure that, like I said, the love and support that I didn't receive at home. And so within that, creating that system and kind of helping people that were ostracized that I also felt ostracized as well too, kind of create a family dynamic that could replicate and also, you know, help give the love that they never necessarily received. So, yeah. Were you born in Canada? How have your experiences as a black identifying 2S LGBTQ plus person impacted you in Canada? Yes, I was born in Canada. Being born in Canada as a black person, especially that as a black African person, um, it's it's difficult just because within Canada having to deal with the underlying racism, that's something that um, it's hard to quantify because it's not a tangible thing. So kind of to walk in a world where you know that you have to work twice as hard is a real reality that we have to face and it's not something that necessarily talked about. So within that, having to work twice as hard and appease your fam familial side as well as your social side and wanting to be able to be a queer person and still having to juggle with being queer and black was a big thing that a lot of people feel like they have to deal with and was something that I dealt with a lot when I was younger but thankfully now that's something that we necessarily don't have to really deal with the younger generation because they're lucky enough to kind of have that support system that we didn't have before. Are there any differences between your culture and the mainstream Canadian culture? Absolutely everything. Everything it is, absolutely everything. Discipline, how you view your parents, how you speak, how you walk, how you talk, um, your morals and your traditions. Um, I think some, some of the ways that I was raised in regards to how I speak to elders, how you would hold things in regards to mental health and the denial of it, how uh, we're told to deal with racism and just let it go. But our younger generations now, we're starting to kind of break free from that and kind of stand up for ourselves in the sense of wanting more and being able to speak up about it because unfortunately, we don't have to deal with the pressure that our parents had to deal with back in the day. So there's a big difference, but it's also a slight change that has to deal with like, you know, a simulation and kind of merging both cultures together. Are there any displacement challenges you faced within the Canadian culture? I personally haven't felt that way because I was born here. However, I witnessed a lot of people that have come here seeking refuge and being able to find and seek and make community that they necessarily didn't have back home. To be able to come from places and to find a sense of community for people that are like-minded and you can share that is amazing. Um, the biggest idea would be the Bahamian community, um, especially seeing how well they've been able to have to deal with the, um, the refugees to, um, process and coming here, but within that, being able to find a sense of community and finding themselves and growing and kind of being able to be the authentic queer person that they were meant to be, and then maybe the city couldn't have a chance to be back home. What are the biggest immigration challenges that you have faced or have heard others have faced? 
Um, unfortunately, sorry, for fortunately, I haven't had to face much or any uh, immigration problems. However, the, the I'm just assuming the paperwork in the process. Well, to be honest, I can't even assume because I personally haven't experienced anything like that. But hearing the stories of a lot of my friends and family and knowing of the processes that they have to go through to even prove their queerness and having to deal with that process or even having to deal with their loved ones in that sponsorship process, it's a hard community. I just can't fathom leaving your whole family behind and coming into a new world to try to figure out who you are and still having to deal with the balance of your family back home and then also maybe providing for your family back home while still attempting to provide for yourself over here. There's a lot of stories and a lot of things that the government could do to help people like that, as well as the focus on like black and queer community refugees. I think there should be a bigger focus on that, but yeah. Hi, I'm Rashad Ryan, AKA Prince Sembo, or Navy, AKA Sembo Escada. Um, a couple of things about me in regards to ballroom. I've been in the ballroom scene in Toronto for about 11 years now? No, 10 years now. Um, a couple of categories I walk, runway, um, best dress, a lot of other fashion categories. And then I've been in Escada for about two years now. And I'm also in that house for best dress and runway. Mental health impacts folks from all backgrounds. How uniquely does mental health impact the ballroom community in Toronto? I feel like individuals from the LG, LGBTQ plus community that are coming into ballroom are already dealing with mental health issues from outside traumas. So when they enter into the ballroom community with them and they don't know their support or ways to support for it, and there's outlets in the, in the LGBTQ plus community in Toronto that they get access for it, I feel like it doesn't get taken care of and then it could develop into something bigger and could be worse. Do you feel that there's a stigma associated with mental health and the Black community? Yes, I do feel that there is a stigma um, regarding mental health in the back Black community, um, especially in the Caribbean community. Um, growing up in the Caribbean community um, and in a household that was heavily in church, um, it was very much, if I have any issues or anything that's bothering me, I should take it to God instead of talking to someone, a physical person that may be able to help me. And then also within the Caribbean communities, um, if men show any signs of weak, sorry, if men show any signs of emotions or anything that's bothering them, they're looked upon as weak. So between the two of those, it makes it harder for anyone to address mental health, especially in the black community. How do you think stigma impacts folks' ability to seek help? The stigmas that are, um, the stigmas that are seen and um, showcased from the outside community makes it harder for people to know that it is okay to look for help and that there is actual sources that they can get help from and affordable sources also. Um, so I feel like those stigmas that the, the media has portrayed on mental health has made it harder for people to feel like it's okay to look for help and to feel that it is even okay to say that they need help. What do you think should be done by mainstream communities to support the Black 2S LGBTQ plus communities? specifically the ballroom community? Um, first and foremost, I feel like um, the mainstream community, when they're entering into the ballroom community, they should be aware of the privilege that they already have. And that privilege can sometimes, well, not sometimes, that privilege usually overshadows us in this, in this community that are already struggling to have our voices heard. So when they do enter our community, I, it would be good for them to be aware of the privilege that they already have and be, um, be willing to take a step back to allow us to speak first so that our voices can be heard first as the, the majority. And also uh, funding. <laughs> it's already hard enough for um, the ballroom scene in Toronto to get funding from mainstream um, outlets. So with the mainstream outlets coming and supporting the balls and being in attendance, them helping with funding is a great way to support also. Uh, my name is Eugene Diwa, aka King Monroe. My pronouns are he, him. Um, I am a professional dancer. I am a um, teacher and educator, and I'm also a painter and visual artist. Um, I've been part of the ballroom community, the Toronto ballroom community for um, about two years now. And my main categories are um, realness with a twist, um, up and coming sex siren, um, all American runway, and um, I think that's it, that's me. We often hear the rate of drug use among certain communities is higher than others. In your opinion, have you seen a difference in the prevalence of drug use within the ballroom community? 
Um, in terms of substance abuse or substance in general, um, I haven't really seen much of a difference in terms of prevalence. In my opinion, bottom community is basically just another community that's taking part within the substance abuse or just substance in general. Um, I've noticed that with other communities, yes, it is pretty active, um, although to be honest, it's, it, I see it all the same. It's really just another community within the substance. Why do you think this is the case? What I okay, what I mainly realize as someone that's in the ballroom scene, I've been I've been in the ballroom scene for um, two years now. Um, the main thing that I realize is that everyone is in the ballroom scene to have fun at the end of the day. Um, just as partying, just as going out, just as hanging with friends, um, substances does play a big part in it. And so, with the fun within the ballroom community, there has been substances that have been brought in. Um, but a lot of the time, it's more so they just don't talk about it. Um, what I do find is that, again, because a lot of people are there for the fun of it, everyone partakes in it socially. Um, whereas, I can't really say for anything out like behind closed doors or anything, but a lot of the time, because it is socially and because like a lot of your friends are doing it, a lot of people do partake in it, and it is publicly, in that sense, more prevalent. Yeah. In your opinion, is substance use prevalent among certain age groups, or does it impact everyone equally? Personally, it does impact everyone equally, um, although it is, as you did say, um, more prevalent within the younger age group. I, I want to say, like, 20s to 30s, mainly, mainly like mid-20s. Um, again, a lot of the time, a lot of these kids coming into the bar community are outside of high school. Um, they're trying to find themselves, and at this, at this point in their life, there's like again a lot of partying a lot of hanging out with friends because you're no longer in school so you have a lot more time on your hands i want to say within the ages of like 20 to 30 even like up to like 35 is the most common that i've seen in terms of um, substance use um but i've known people that have been way over that age limit and like i said it is it is common with everybody it's just it is more prevalent within the younger what do you feel should be done to lower the number of drug overdoses or deaths within the ballroom communities um, within our community specifically, um, I would say that we're one of the main problems, well there's a few problems, um, one of the main problems is that, like I said, because everyone is there for the fun of substance use, no one's actually there for when shit hits the fan and when shit becomes serious. No one actually wants to admit that they have a problem with their substances and when it comes to trying to find the help, there's not really anyone to turn to because all your peers that are in the community with you are on the same wavelength of just doing the substances for fun. So not a lot of people actually know how to deal with getting away from it or the rehab or I guess coming back from all that. Um, another issue is this whole houses thing. Yes, we all say that, you know, our houses are family and stuff, but again, because everyone is there for the fun, when shit hits the fan and things become serious, no shade, not everyone in your house will actually talk to you about the shit that's going on. So because of that, it's also harder for you to speak about the issues that you're going through because it's like, yeah, you may have the one or two people there that you can connect with and cool, talk to them. Use those people as your outlet to be like, yo, I got something going on. If you can help me out, I totally appreciate it. But at the end of the day, it's very hard for people to even talk about or even admitting that they have a problem with substances. So one, it's admitting that and two, it's finding help. At the same time, because, again, it always goes back to the whole, it's all for the fun of it. A lot of the people that I know that have come back from substance abuse and have gone away from it are not really in the community and not as involved as they used to be from before. So again, in terms of going to the resources, it's like we don't really know who's there to help us out because again, no one likes to talk about it. No one likes to talk about it. And sometimes if we do talk about it, we have the fear of judgment because of course it's, it's substances. Everyone has their own judgment about it. And usually when it comes to addiction, people kind of put you in like a bad light or they see you as like a different character because of these substances. So again, it's just, it's more so being open-hearted for other people when like, people actually do talk to you about it and at the same time um, I feel like workshops would help um, and more so the people that have gone from it or that have come back from it I get that sometimes it might not be um, 
their initiative to actually be like, hey, I've gone through this, let's work out or like, let's help each other out. At the same time, it's also like outsourcing. You know what I mean? Like people within your houses, even if you, um, even if you have those discussions, just knowing that they've gone through it um, and just be like, hey, I'm open to, you know, having a talk to anyone. Even if you tell your house leaders, hey, I've been through this, I'm down to talk to anyone about it. I know sometimes they might not feel comfortable to speak about it, but um, at the end of the day, it's a step. And I honestly do encourage everybody, um, even myself, I didn't really start, I didn't really start getting back to <laughs> being normal until I admitted to myself and actually sat there and said, I am starting to get a problem. It's at that point when I realized that I actually do need to take a step back and reassess myself. Now, don't get me wrong. I still do, I still do it for the fun of it, but now I know my limits. Um, now I know how, like, I know that there's a line to, there's a line to be crossed and I know when to not cross that line. Uh, for me personally, going through um, that time of substance abuse, um, it really messed with my head. Um, and it also really messed with like my thoughts and like everyday work. Um, I started noticing that there were some days where I would tell myself, okay, I need to do this so I can do this. And it, it was actually at that point when I started to realize that I was starting to become addicted to it because there shouldn't ever be a reason that I need to take this in order for me to do something else. So it was at that point when I started to take a step back and basically reassess myself. And now don't get me wrong, I didn't go cold turkey because of course I was still in it and you know, I still want to do it for the fun of it and all. But at the same time, now realizing it and now realizing where I stood with it, I had to start making the steps for myself to start getting myself back together, which was cutting down and actually talking about it. Actually talking about it to friends and close family who would be like, who would actually check up on you, that's the thing. At the end of the day, y'all don't have to talk for like hours on end. Even if it's a simple checkup, because we all understand that like everyone's busy. Even a simple checkup of, hey, how's it going? Have you been keeping up with this, this, this? Or have you been keeping up to set to what you said that you wanted to do? At the end of the day, we also have to hold each other accountable for our actions. And honestly, if you say that you're there for someone, actually be there for someone. Be genuine about it. Actually stick to your integrity of what you say. You know what I mean? If, if you say that you're gonna be there for someone, actually be there for someone. If you say that you're there to listen to someone, actually be there and be present, you know? At the end of the day, even if you don't know what to say, say you don't know what to say. Just be like, yo, um, I, I hear everything that you're telling me. I totally feel it. Um, it's just at this point, I don't know what to say because it is a lot of information, but understand that I'm still here for you. The fact that for other people to say, I'm still here for you, or I, I will always still be here for you, even if they say it in the beginning, it's always going to reassure the person and make them feel more comfortable to even talk about other situations moving forward. Do you believe house leaders should have some sort of training on how to deal with drug abuse and overdose? Um, I do believe that house leaders um, should have some sort of training um, in terms of um, substance abuse and like those that do come forward about it. Um, it could be as easy as talking to your peers that have gone through it or um, even um, even just communicating with other house leaders within the community because again it's I'm, it's not just your house and yourself that is going through what it is that you're going through you need to understand that everyone is going through it it's just at the end of the day you need to come you need to find the confidence within yourself to actually speak about it and not be afraid to speak about it because at the end of the day, it's your fear that holds you back from actually progressing anywhere in life. These houses are safe spaces, and at the end of the day, they say that your family, they say that like they're your friends, so you should be able to confide in them. It tells me that someone is actually genuinely supporting me and wants to know that I am actually genuinely okay. Not for the sake of just asking it, but to actually mean it and to see it through. No, you can't touch my hair.